All right, well, here we are at PDAC. I'm Stephen Lawrence. I'm editor-in-chief and publisher of Investor Intel, and I'm really lucky today to have a distinguished panel of uh, gold companies where we're going to talk a little bit about uh, gold, the future of gold, and uh, how the markets are looking at it these days. So I have to introduce my panel from uh, my right, your left. Uh, first, we have Simon Ridgway, who is the uh, president and CEO of Volcanic uh, Gold Mines. Uh, next to him, next to me, John Contact who is the uh, president of West Red Lake Gold Mines as well. And on my other side, uh, we have uh, Jim Indahl, CEO of Mass Gold Corp. And not last but not least, on the end, Joel Freudman, who is the uh, CEO of uh, True Precious Metals. So welcome everyone, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we could just take a very brief second just to um, introduce yourselves and your projects, and then we'll start talking about some gold. Okay, Simon Ridgeway. So, our projects are in Guatemala. Company is Volcanic Gold Mines. We are from the properties from uh, Radius Gold. So, we've been active in, I have been active in Guatemala for some, up and on for some 15, 20 years. We got a, some very high grade gold silver results over the last six months. Um, website VG. Hello, my name is John Contact. I'm the president of West Red Lake Gold Mines. I'm part of an experienced management team. This will be the third time that we monetize gold exploration and development assets in Ontario. Our last project was in Timmins, Ontario, and we sold a two million ounce resource to McEwen Mining for $250 million, or $125 an ounce. Now we have the West Red Lake project. It's in Red Lake, Ontario. There's three former mines on the property. At the Rowan Mine site, we have a 1.1 million ounce uh, inferred resource. It's 0.57 grams per ton. It was within 500 meters and it's of, of surface and it's open to depth. Uh, we also are developing a second resource deposit on the property and wanting to get the property from the 1.1 million resource we're at right now to the 2 million ounce resource we had in Timmins and looking for capital flows into the gold sector to revalue gold in the ground in Ontario uh, upwards uh, to more the level of $125 an ounce that it was at the end of the last cycle. Thank you, John. You've done this before, I can tell. <laughs> Jim. I'm Jim Ingdahl, CEO of Mass Gold Corp, and our projects are in Saskatchewan in the LaRange Greenstone Belt area. And, and that really is an area that's been developed uh, over the, before the turn of the century. Many deposits found, several mines put into production. Uh, a lot of them didn't make it uh, because of the price of gold at that time was 300 or less. Uh, but all of those gold deposits are still there and we're a company that's consolidating that and right to this point in time we have 1.1 million ounces. Our target is to be at one and a half to two million ounces this year by the end of the year once our drill programs are finished and results all in uh, uh, with hopefully uh, uh, a, a, a second round going the next winter with a target of three million for 2023 but there's still lots of opportunity there uh, it's projects that have been shut in and the price of gold has only gone uh, up about six or seven times since since they was originally uh, attempted to be put into production uh, and the cost hasn't gone up that much. So as we talk a little bit more about the gold, I think the opportunity will really show what, what we have there and, uh, and the, what we're doing with that whole orange belt where we control half of it at this point in time right now. Great, thanks. And Joel, how's, true, how's it going at True? Joel Freudman, co-founder and CEO of True Precious Metals. Uh, we have a gold and rose project in central Newfoundland, which is our flagship project. It's sandwiched between the two largest gold deposits in uh, Atlanta, Canada. So on one side is Marathon Gold, 5 million ounces of gold. On the other side of us is a company called Matador with 840,000 ounces. And we control almost all the land between those two companies. So best place to look for a gold mine, right beside other gold mines. We have about 40 kilometers of strike length between the two of them. Uh, we are financed. We recently did a raise. And we're setting out to drill in Q3 of this year to target a new, a new part of the property, which has never been drilled before showing very strong indications, not only of gold and silver, also of high grade copper based on surface samples. So yeah. I'm certainly excited about the drilling on our property. We're, we're earlier stage than uh, my colleagues here. Well, it's great. And, and so we have a lot of experience here on, on the panel about gold. So the big question, of course, is end of 2015, gold was around $1,100 an ounce. Today, it's upwards of 1,800. Are the juniors benefiting from that at all? 
we were. I mean, the last couple of years have been, a, you know, it stagnated a little bit. I think, I think, you know, we're we're seeing uh, everybody running into cash right now on all the markets, whether it be the you know the big Dow or the Bitcoin market or the or the junior gold markets. So we're getting sold off, but I do think that there's a pretty good upside over the next 12 months for gold. When the big markets fail, as they are right now, then people usually turn to gold as a, as a safe haven after some months of selling. I think that'll happen again later this year and next year. Time will tell, of course. I kind of agree with that point of view because when you look at the price of gold where it is today, uh, if it stays there for a long time, I think we all know that there ain't too many deposits right now that you can't make economical at this price. Uh, and the risk is, I don't believe in it going down a whole lot further. I think the opportunity for that to grow, and as you referred to, the, the cryptocurrency world uh, collapse will uh, is not too far around the corner, I believe. Uh, and that should bring back a lot of those junior millennial investors that kind of disappeared from the markets uh, for a while. Uh, but that's what we're suffering from is some things like that that we have no control on. But as long as the price stays where it's at, I think all of our companies will have great shots at getting to the right level. The, the problem that it creates, though, is, is the financing for the projects. And uh, uh, if you've got a good shareholder base, that works. That still can work for you, and we have that. So that's, uh, that's how we're approaching life these days, and we're just closing a financing, too. Uh, actually, I think today or tomorrow. So. Any, anyone's a good one. You bet. I mean, yeah. if you look at March 2020, gold got liquidated along with everything else, but it subsequently gold and precious metals, like including silver, really took off following the crash. And so, you know, to your point, I think a similar pattern wouldn't be unexpected. And we're we're talking in Canada where we're at anyway, and I think it sounds like everybody else here. Uh, we're talking in Canadian dollars, so that's north of 2,400 an ounce, and, and so that that's significant uh, when you talk about. And I don't believe our dollar is going to gain a whole lot of strength uh, uh, over the next while, but uh, you never know. With the world the way it is, uh, affecting all kinds of markets that nobody can really forecast these days. It's really a, 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 a scramble bag of trying to figure out what is really affecting it. Is it the Russian-Ukrainian war? Is it uh, uh, some, some other factors? But all of those things are certainly playing it's increasingly turning anti-mining in a number of other jurisdictions, and so certainly being in a safe jurisdiction or one that's favorable to mining is a big leg up. Very much so. We've taken the approach to, uh, um, we're not a, we don't consider ourselves an explorer, a junior explorer. We're acquiring historical resources and then upgrading them or bringing them back in. And, uh, our cost of, of uh, adding ounces to our balance sheet uh, right now is in the $6 an ounce range, which is a whole lot cheaper than exploring for it. Uh, but it does take a little time, and the points you made on the ESG, those are really critical factors, and, and you really got to pay attention to them. But you also got to look at new technologies that are out there these days that are starting to really show up, and uh, some are getting more tested. And I think you're going to see a lot of that opportunity come into play, That although it might take a little longer, maybe the efficiencies also, with technology, might be a little better too. So, sometimes when I speak to um, you know in potential investors, uh, what I mention is to be when you're in the in the gold business, to some extent you have to be an amateur macroeconomist. So some people are, of course, professional macroeconomists. Uh, I'm an amateur macroeconomist, but I think it's important if you're in the precious metal sector, including the gold sector, that that uh, that you have that outlook because it's so. Uh, we're, 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 the, the price of gold, say in U.S. dollar terms, is so relative to large macroeconomic forces, and I think that what the, the, I may have, uh, offer a scenario in which there may be some relief in sight for us in the gold sector, and, it's, and especially the exploration and development side, like ourselves. And that is that you know the, the macroeconomic story has become inflation right. on a global basis, and I think any talk of it being uh, transitory. I don't, I don't even hear the word anymore, uh, so I shouldn't say it myself, but the, uh, it's here, it's baked into the system, it, it would appear, and uh, what is most important for us in the gold sector, I think, is what's traditionally used to fight inflation is increasing interest rates. Uh, but now, with uh, uh, an, uh, 
an economy that's become so uh, used to free money, whether it's uh, or you know, interest-free money, I should say, uh, whether it's the real estate sector or, or equity markets, uh, they uh, are very sensitive. And I, I, I read this morning there's a 93% chance that the Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. is going to increase the federal funds rate by uh, 75 basis points this afternoon. That's be essentially doubling the federal funds rate. Uh, and then there's a meeting in August and one in September, and, and anything I read from professional economists or business people, bankers, executives, is that there's only so much of this the economy can take. So what really does happen in the gold sector, historically speaking, not me speaking, but in prior cycles, is if you have negative real interest rates, nothing's more positive for the gold sector than negative real interest rate. Just simply taking the consumer inflation number and so, uh, subtracting the, 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 the bank rate from that. And so we're, we're in historical, we're going to be in a, we're in a period and we're going to be in a period of, uh, of, of negative real interest rates. And, and I think the real game comes on for the gold sector when central bankers around the world realize that they cannot fight inflation by the traditional method of increasing uh, central bank interest rates. And when that policy pauses or gets reversed, I think it's going to take for the most of 22 for that to happen. Uh, but when that happens, you know, I think there's going to be a, people are going to realize that gold is going to provide its professional, uh, its traditional role in the financial system. And, and we could see a price of gold in U.S. dollar terms that goes back to $2,000 and looks like it's going higher. And that would really be uh, something where the, not, the gold companies, producing companies, and certainly in Canada with an 80 cent dollar, more or less, you know, 2,000 gold, once $2,400 gold, $2,500 gold becomes over $3,000 gold uh, in Canadian dollar terms. The companies get very, very profitable. And for companies like ourselves that are exploration and development stories and don't bring mines into production but turn them over to gold miners, this bodes very well for our shareholders because eventually the gold producing companies become cash rich and asset poor. And, th and that's when they start paying, rather than $10 an ounce in the ground, or 15 or 20, which is what companies are getting right now, exploration and development stories. Just historically speaking, we did a deal uh, in the last cycle uh, in Timmins, we had 2,000 ounces. Uh, we sold it for $250 million, the property in Timmins for $250 million value transaction to McEwen Mining. That was $125 an ounce. What stage was that at? Uh, Pre-feasibility? No, it was just at a resource. Expiration stage. Yeah, expiration stage right? only. So uh, what we've been what we wanted what we've been doing is uh, we have a resource at Rowan. It's 1.1 million ounces. It's 7.57 grams per ton, and it's open. It's within 500 meters meters of surface, and it's open to depth. And what we've been doing is is doing surface channel sampling to show how this could be a near producing asset on a surface mining basis and a bulk sample basis because I think what's going to be important for this cycle from an exploration development point of view is that you truly do have an economic deposit that's close to production. So in the last cycle some of these and the producing companies got in, you know kind of had to write down assets over this because they overpaid for assets that they said that were, that they were going to be producing in two or three years and ten years later they're not producing so you want to show it's a near producing asset. Is, is so is your previous deposit you sold in production now? No, it's not. It's not. Yeah, there you go. There, there you go. go. And so that's why we're doing the sort of the. Have the, they grown it since then? Not, not. It hasn't not, not been the focus. Not has not been the focus. So I think, you know, whether large companies, medium-sized producers, all these gold companies, you know, when gold, when gold went to two thousand uh, dollars at the top of the last cycle, and people, some people were talking three thousand, four thousand, five thousand. Instead, it went to eleven hundred. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of assets had to be written down. So I think the comp gold, co gold producing companies have learned that. They're well managed now. They're focused on cost. And if we get positive macroeconomics that has an increasing price of gold with an 80 cent Canadian dollar, with the whole thing structurally sets up for a, positive, a very positive environment. You know, it's, it's a long time coming. Uh, with a few exceptions, 2016 and, and 2020, it's been a gold bear market for a decade. Uh, but, you know, for the first 10 years of this century, it was a positive market for six out of 10 years or so. Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to believe, but there are things as gold bull markets and macroeconomics tends to lead the way and hopefully that's going to come to our side. And I, I wouldn't, you know, given where we are right now with the inflation story and central bankers being in a bit of a box and now they're trying to increase the, the, the bank rates, but you know, there's going to be an outcry relatively soon. 
You know, politicians get involved midterm election, midterm elections in the U.S., etc. And I just see these policies of tightening, you know, being reversed, and I think that becomes a green light for the gold business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and that kind of leads me into the next question, um, uh, Jim Joel. Is there uh, is there an appetite for gold right now? I mean, and that's a double barrel question because, or actually, it's got a lot of barrels because you've got the um, you've got the acquirers. You've got the retail investors, you've got the institutional investors, you've got the people who are, are backing the projects. Is, is gold, you know, it, for a long time, cannabis was the flavor of the week, uh, sucked all the air out of the room. Um, we just saw crypto yesterday, they, you know, they reported lost $200 billion of crypto value in one day yesterday, and it was the flavor of the of the week for a long time. Is, is, is gold popular, especially you know, millennials, is, is gold an old man investment? Or is it is it becoming popular again with a whole new generation of investors? Talk, talk fully answer this question. Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> Forget about the politics, just go for it. That's right. It's something to be tactful. No one's watching. You know what, I think, I think the, the, uh, the themes that would appeal to an older crowd should also appeal to a younger crowd. People are looking for a hedge against, you know, governments kind of running money printing endlessly and making the currency worth less. That's why, you know, p younger people are turning to crypto as well. I think gold fulfills a very similar function, it just has a much longer history with a more durable track record as a store of value and hedge against inflation. I think there's still a good case for it. Um, you know, for retail investors, I guess that interest seems to wax and wane kind of just like the gold price pumping up and down between a range. But certainly, on, I think on an industry level, yeah, companies are increasingly running out of good projects. And so, you know, that's a good longer term value driver for you know, exploration stage company like us and even other companies that are close to resource stage or production. The majors are going to run out of resources. They need to re replenish their resources. They're obviously playing the long game and they just look to go down the chain and pick off, you know, whoever else is able to bring ounces. Yeah, and the, and the, the cryptocurrency thing uh, was one of the factors for sure. Uh, that, uh, it, But I think the millennials uh, will start thinking, because gold now does not have the excitement that crypto and uh, marijuana had several months ago. That kind of, I think, is worn off. Mm -hmm. And so will they return to uh, something that still is pretty exciting, but less adrenaline rush than, <laughs> than a cryptocurrency? Uh, I think they're going to understand that that's just a Ponzi scheme. For the most part, you don't get but, wiped out but, in gold, but you can get wiped out in crypto you sure or cannabis. Can. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the bit. You say that the returned, but they were never in the gold market. They, they probably weren't, but they're going to look at. They're going to. Yeah, they're going to understand there's nothing behind cryptocurrency. And gold is behind uh, uh, currencies of, of the world, mainly the US, but. And that gives it some stability and uh, some reason for being. But it's, there's also strong demand increasing for the physical gold as well. And that's going to keep, I think, things in balance for that's the most part. Like the central banks, a number of central banks have been stockpiling gold. Russia's increasingly using gold to back yeah. its falling ruble. That's now increasing. Central banks are large buyers. Forget people going buying little amounts of jewelry. I mean, there's still significant central bank demand for gold, which tells me that, you know, People in charge of monetary policy still think it has a significant value. So. And, and a decade ago, China was stockpiling gold. Yeah. They became yeah. one of the biggest gold holders of the world. We haven't heard a lot from them lately uh, on the gold front. So maybe they've got enough gold at this point, if you could ever have enough gold. <laughs> or, they're, or you're just not disclosing what it is they're doing for some sort of deal. Yes. So they're not selling any. They're not selling no, they're, the they're consuming it all domestically. If I could just speak to on the millennial thing, because it comes up so often at, at you know, including our conferences. And, uh, the, I think the millennials, for one could say, for example, that for the last 10 years, they've been doing the right thing in the sense that they've been buying their home or the place where they live in an increase in real estate market environment. That makes a lot of sense. They've been buying uh, large tech. Uh, this is tech they know and they use and they know the companies and they know the executives and they like what they're doing and they've done well in the market. Apple, Google, Facebook. And so what's wrong with the plan? Well, the wrong, well you know, there's nothing wrong with that plan for the last 10 years. And the other thing on the total, the, the gold sector in terms of return on capital basis really hasn't performed at that level. So, but this is rolling over. I think, you know, we're right in the middle of it rolling over. Uh, we can see how large uh, equity markets, how jittery they are. The big tech is rolling over. 
sort of real, no, nothing's more sensitive, real, uh, interest rates in real estate. So, you know, so when, when gold and commodities in general start to show a return on capital and appreciating equities, I think the millennials, a lot of which took undergraduate degrees in finance and obviously worked spreadsheets very well and know how to study markets and sectors, et cetera, when they see commodities, including precious metals, outperforming, I don't think they're going to be saying, well, that's daddy's uh, dirty uh, mining project. No, they're going to say, I can make money there uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to start out, you know, uh, rotating into it. Uh, so, so here we are at BDAC, and uh, just to sort of finish up, uh, you know, and this has been incredibly unscientific, but uh, you know, it's maybe as good a, a, a gauge as anything. You've been walking the floors, you've been talking to people, we're back for the first time in a couple of years. What's the sentiment on the floor about gold? It's pretty optimistic, I think. I mean, I think there's quite a, usually when the when the markets take, I mean, they always take a dip at PDAC, it seems. The oh, yes, yes. We the, had one of those yesterday. Every yes. year. But, but the, the attitude of the, all the people I'm talking to seems, everybody's, like the panel here, pretty optimistic on the price going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, that's what I've been hearing. And uh, again, uh, the, there's no reason that the prices are going to go down if they haven't gone down yet, or gold price. So I think the, the, the thought is positive on the upward swing uh, and maybe significant upward swing. So I think, and that's what most people believe here, and, and I think it's generally the right attitude. And I've been seeing some financings the last little while as well. That's always a good sign. That's a good sign. That people are prepared to put some money into it. There's some very good buys in the market today, in the yeah. juniors, and if you believe in it, and if you're a good, uh, uh, got some capital behind you, it's a great opportunity, I think, right now. Yeah, we just managed to close a financing despite the markets about a month ago. We got uh, participation from the Sprott flow through fund, another flow through fund, as well as some high net worth. Yeah. There are still people cutting checks in this environment and into gold, and they want to diversify their assets. So it, it does happen. The greater the merit of the project, the more money you can raise. Well, great. Well, thank you all for participating in the panel. It's been thank very you, enlightening, you. and uh, it's been great catching up with everyone. So enjoy the rest of PDAC, and uh, look forward to hearing more about you all. Thank okay. you very much. Pleasure. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.